Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Wineskins features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with thoughts on a variety of issues and topics from a Catholic perspective. It is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, we will enjoy an interview that I had with Dr. Lou Zona from our series called Spotlight. We will also look at the life and times of St. John Bosco, and we will hear a reflection on the readings for this fourth Sunday in Ordinary Time. That and more coming up on Wineskins. In our current issue today, we will hear from Father Jack Lavelle on small faith communities. The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. In this exhortation, I wish to encourage the Christian faithful to embark upon a new chapter of evangelization, marked by this joy while pointing out new paths for the Church's journey in years to come. These words are the introductory words of Pope Francis in The Joy of the Gospel. He later writes, I dream of a missionary option, that is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the Church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, languages and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. Pope Francis immediately follows this statement with a discussion about the role of the parish community when he states, In all its activities, the parish encourages and trains its members to be evangelizers. It is a community of communities, a sanctuary where the thirsty come to drink in the midst of their journey, and a center of constant missionary outreach. We must admit, though, that the call to review and renew our parishes has not yet sufficed to bring them nearer to people, to make them environments of living communion and participation and to make them completely mission-oriented. As such, Bishop David Bonner, in his first pastoral letter, Testify to the Light, has stated, It is my dream that parishes will form small groups for people to share their faith and support one another as they become disciples. These small groups can be tailored to accommodate people's schedules and be made up of men, women, married couples, and single individuals. By coming together in a small venue, individuals can share their faith and encounter Jesus through the gospel, and in other ways enabling them to go forth and proclaim the gospel. Small groups are a powerful way to accompany one another as pilgrims on the journey. In forming small groups within our parishes, members of the parish community are invited to share their faith with one another as they grow in their discipleship. As members of the family of God, by coming together in the small group setting of six to twelve people, you have an opportunity to create long-lasting, genuine relationships with people who share your faith and want to be part of your life. Together, you can share and live out the joy of the gospel through fellowship, prayer, and worship while growing in your Catholic faith. Why should you consider joining a small group? First, it is a unique mission. Small groups can help you learn and discern as you live out the unique mission God has given to you on this earth. They can help you to share the joy of the gospel with others in your lives. There's also a community and a relational aspect. Small groups build our sense of community and help us to belong to the family of God at the parish. Small groups are an opportunity to create deep and lasting relationships with people who will share times of joy in your life, as well as encourage and help you in times of difficulty. With our faith, small groups help us to know, love, and serve the Lord through prayer, generosity, and evangelization. They help you to build your faith and strengthen your friendship with Christ and the Catholic Church. And there's a point of relevance. Small groups are flexible and can select materials geared towards members' interests and needs. They help you to receive God's grace in your daily lives. We have embarked on an initiative to establish small faith-sharing groups in all of our parishes throughout the Diocese of Youngstown. I invite you to take some time to pray over your need to be part of one of these small groups. Once you've arrived at the answer, I invite you to contact your parish office where they can locate for you the small group in your parish. Again, let us all continue to work for that day when we will be part 
of the kingdom of God. But until then, we are called to be part of the community of faith disciples here on earth. May we continue in that missionary zeal to revel in the joy of the gospel. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jack Lavelle. To tell us more about the life and times of St. John Bosco is Diana Hencherenko. She is the young adult minister at St. Angela Marici Church in Youngstown. John Bosco was born in the Archdiocese of Turin, Italy in 1815. His father died when he was only two years old. His early years were financially difficult, and at the age of 20, he entered the major seminary, where, thanks to a generous benefactor, he received financial help. John Bosco was ordained a priest on June 5, 1846, and founded the Oratory of St. Francis de Sales. At this time, the city of Turin was on the verge of the Industrial Revolution, which became a challenge for many young men at the time. Gifted as John was as an educator and leader, he formulated a system based on reason, religion, and kindness. In 1868, there were 800 students involved in his educational system. To ensure the continuation of his educational work, he founded the Society of St. Francis de Sales, or the Salesians, which was approved in 1869. In 1875, a wave of immigration to Latin America began and prompted the inauguration of the Salesian missionaries to have an apostolate there. Bosco became a traveler throughout Europe, seeking funds for the missions. Some of the reports referred to him as the new St. Vincent de Paul. This great apostle of youth died on January 31, 1888, and was canonized by Pope Pius XI in 1934. Pope John Paul II named him teacher and father to the young. It is as teacher and father of the young, as stated in the opening prayer of the Mass, that St. John Bosco's life is best summarized. He himself has said in his old age, I promised God that until my last breath, I would live for my poor youth. His own awareness of the fatherhood of God was extremely vivid. He was convinced that without a sense of intimacy with God, it is impossible to be an educator. He said, education is something from the heart and God alone is its master. We cannot succeed in anything unless God gives us the key to these hearts. Of the three qualities that John Bosco required in teachers, kindness was of particular importance. In the Office of Readings, he advises educators to love the young as they would love their own sons. It goes without saying that this also applies to parents as educators. Indeed, parents should be the prototype of teachers. Another characteristic of John Bosco was described by a writer in this way. He knew how to create an impressive system of education by bringing the church back into contact with the masses, which the church was losing. For us who are outside the church, and outside every church, he is really a hero. The hero of preventive education and of the family school. His followers can be proud. In the opening prayer of the Mass, we ask God to give us a love like that of St. John Bosco, so that we may give ourselves completely to your service and to the salvation of mankind. John Bosco especially liked the statement, Jesus began to do before he began to teach. He was truly prophetic in bringing to souls a spirituality based on the apostolate and an asceticism based on work. I do not recommend penance in the discipline, he said, but work, work, work. For Wineskins, I'm Diana Hancharenko. I'm talking with Dr. Lou Zona from the Butler Institute of American Art. You know, Dr. Zona, two of the words that come to my mind when I think of the Butler, but also when I think of you, are art and faith. How do those two go together and why are they important in your life? Certainly faith is very important in my life. But you know, Father, the creative process is reminiscent or, or parallels, I think, the ultimate creative process which the creation of the world by our Lord. So many great paintings, so many great works of art have been inspired by faith. If I could go back in time, mm -hmm. I would love to have been in that group of people in Italy going in to see the Sistine ceiling for the very first time. They say that people drop to their knees because they, they believe that only God could have created this wonderful masterwork. And I think 
for the most part, that still is the situation. Yeah. But like I always tell my students, Jackson Pollock was not necessarily a man of traditional faith, mm -hmm. but here's an abstract painter who was so inventive that, you know, I think that also counts. The creative process, creating something from nothing, is the ultimate act of obvious. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, I was trying to think of an experience that I had many, many years ago visiting a Rome for the first time and walked into the Sistine Chapel, ushered in with hundreds and hundreds of people and looking around, wondering why we were there had no clue because it was dark, it was dingy, and people were just looking around and being ushered out. And it dawned on us that we just went through the Sistine Chapel, but never noticed anything of the ceiling oh, wow. because of it was dark and gloomy. Several years later, I had an opportunity to go back after its restoration. Right. Walking in was a completely different experience. You walk in with a crowd of people, everyone was gazing upward. So just a transformation because of some skilled work of, of artists who restored uh, Michelangelo's just triumph. Yeah, right. and, and how art really captures not only the mind and the eyes, but the soul itself. Why does art do that to us, or why is art important in our life? It illustrates what we normally would not experience. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking about the, your second visit to the Sistine Chapel, there's a painting be, behind the altar mm -hmm. which says so much, the last judgment. And there, Christ is raising the believers into heaven, mm -hmm. and those that are not, he is casting them. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that we see the Christ image as an angry person, right. you know? Mm -hmm. But I've always been fascinated by that pain. I'm also fascinated by the fact that Michelangelo included himself and the Pope <laughs> with the group. Of course, Julius II, Pope Julius sure. II and, and Michelangelo mm -hmm. were very close, yeah. but they also mm -hmm. had problems with one another. Yeah. Let's talk about humankind personally. You know, I'd like to think that all of us are artists in some way. You know, we may not be able to paint or to sculptor right. or to cast, but we all are artists and God has given us some gift yeah. to create and to hand on. Do you see that in, in humanity? I do. Uh, in my own family, I have a daughter who is, just has very rare talents, and uh, neither my wife or I mm -hmm. have those exact talents. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we have other talents that we... Uh, well, you know, it's interesting also, uh, I'd like to go back to the celebration that happened in 2019. There was a big moment for the butler. Anything else significant that happened happened back then that you'd like to highlight for us in celebration of the hundred years of, of the butler? One of the things that we did when we had this special evening, which was so beautiful, I stood up on the stage and I had done a little research and found out the kinds of things that happened in 1919, mm -hmm. including this horrible epidemic. Yeah, it's uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson. Lots of really interesting things. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting that a town like ours, industrial as it was, created this beautiful gem for us, all really going back to the heart of its founder. What was in his heart, do you yeah, think, that really and, and we, led he, him to he, that? He obviously wanted some, uh, he wanted a special building, so he was inspired by the Italian Renaissance. And the, that building with its columns mm -hmm. and other elements pays tribute to the founder who believed that America had so much to offer artistically, and it's time for us to note that. He was a visionary. Joseph Green Butler Jr. was a true visionary. And his original collection was 32 paintings. Today, Father, there's yeah. uh, 2,200 paintings, sure. and mostly paintings, but mm -hmm. prints and drawings mm -hmm. and everything else. One of the interesting things also is our association with the university. We're not part of the university. 
but the energy that the students bring to the Butler sure. every day. The Jambor, the, the student newspaper, did a poll and they found out that the favorite first date place was the Butler. And as you visit the Butler, you, you see the young couples walking around. It's, it's free, mm -hmm. it's beautiful, mm -hmm. it's humorous, it, it has so much to offer. Kids take advantage of it. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website www.doy.org of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We all share the same sun, and we share the same moon, and we share the air that we breathe. But we all share much more, every soul at its core knows what every other person hopes and needs. Every heart wants to grow, every mind needs to know, every voice wants the chance to be heard. Every person who lives shares the hope they can give. Let us all share the joy, share the joy. Còn chia sẻ hơn thế nữa, mọi trái tim mất trên thế gian cần biết đến mong mỏi như yêu quân nhân người xa. time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Around the block or around the world, share the joy. Church World Service. They say America is a land of opportunity. But for some of us, it's not so easy. Today, one out of every six children in America lives in poverty. Where every day is hard. And there's never enough. But we don't want a handout. We want a way out. This is America. Together, we can do so much. Will you help? Nearly 13 million children live in poverty. Make a difference. Go to PovertyUSA.org and get involved. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. By the time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, Share the joy. Church World Service. Our music today is provided by Fernando Ortega. It is from his CD called Hymns of Worship. And when I am alone, 
On this, the fourth Sunday in Ordinary Time, we will hear more about the Sacred Scriptures by Father Jim McCarns. He is Pastor Emeritus of St. Paul Church in North Canton. If you tell people they're attractive, they're intelligent, they'll sing your praises, they'll call you the greatest. But if you admonish them for imprudence or sinfulness, well, they'll lose composure and you'll lose friendship. Most of us don't accept correction gracefully, and we usually tell our monitors, hey, why don't you mind your own business? It was, however, the sacred business of the biblical prophets to solicit reforms from society with avenging messages from God. Faithfulness to the demands of their office normally left them with few friends. In the first reading today, we meet the outstanding prophet of the Old Testament, Jeremiah. For 40 arduous years, he exposed the national guilt of the nation. He wrote the longest book in the entire Bible. He endured really violent abuse and from discontented people the people he tried to reform. Although God promised him personal protection, like a fortified city, he found the work difficult, sometimes displeasing, maybe revolting. Candidly, he confessed his continual struggle between public commitment and personal doubt. So what motivated him to continue? It was his profound conviction that his prophetic vocation was genuine, conferred by God. Although tempted many times, he would not abandon it. Jeremiah articulated the unchanging pleas that touch today's world. We have promises often broken, religious vocations, business commitments, marriage vows, personal obligations. But Jeremiah lived and died his calling. He would no doubt call our world people, they say, burnouts or cop-outs. He would say, it's such a lax generation. 600 years later, the greatest prophet of all times faced similar problems as Jeremiah, as noted in today's gospel. Of course, that was Jesus himself. A mutinous crowd, a selfish crowd, escorted Jesus from his hometown, intending to hurl him over a cliff. He had dared to preach religious and social improvement to a very unreform-minded people. The prophets continue to speak to us today not only in Scripture, but in the souls and the voices of those who promote timeless values of love and honesty. Genuine prophets preach 
not their own words, but God's. And they will suffer and even die for the message. My friends, if you find a true prophet, you've found a real friend. He or she will lead you to God. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim McCarns. I believe that an open mind is one of the greatest frontiers in the universe. Its possibilities are limitless. The future belongs to those people who are willing to stretch their minds and expand their circle of understanding. Are we willing to have an open mind to God's possibilities for each of us? Wineskins is made possible through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Our program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda. Thank you for being with us. Have a blessed week. you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.